All right. So today we're going to talk a bunch about uh, a bunch of different tests that you can use. Uh, so we talked about, you know, last time, basic comparison, limit comparison, these sorts of things. And, you know, we'd seen something like that in improper integrals, right? We'd seen a basic comparison test, the limit comparison test there. I guess maybe it's a little unfair to say we're going to learn another conversion. Eh, it's another convergence test. Um, but what we're going to do, I guess, first is let's see, when we did improper integrals, we talked about sort of conditional convergence of improper integrals and absolute convergence of improper integrals, right? So we're going to start with that. We're going to talk about that first. Um, and again, it's going to effectively mirror what we did in terms of improper integrals. And the proofs are very similar as well. So there isn't anything too crazy there. And then we're going to do stuff that's kind of like special to series, right? That uh, doesn't really have an uh, improper integral and uh, analog. So, oh man, there's just so much we got to do. Let's see how it goes. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about alternating series. So unlike improper integrals, we actually have to sort of define something away here. So alternating series. All right, and so we'll start with the definition. So an alternating series is any series of the following form. following form. So it could look like this. Uh, da, da, da. Or it could look like this. Okay, and this is sort of like unnecessary to be this pedantic, but we'll do it for now. Right, so it's any series where basically you you know we can write it as this negative one to the power of some k, uh, a k where a k is non-negative. So what we're basically saying is precisely that the terms are alternating in their signs, right? So it goes from like positive negative, positive negative. Maybe it's zero a couple times in between there, but effectively it's alternating in its signs. Okay. Now importantly here, we're not saying that like. It just sometimes is positive, sometimes negative, because effectively every series does that in some way, or even you know demonstrates any other sort of regularity. Like it's not alternating if it goes plus plus minus minus plus plus minus minus plus plus minus minus. You can turn that into an alternating series, but strictly speaking, it's not. Okay, so it has to alternate and be positive, sort of one thing, or let's say non-negative one thing, and then uh, non-positive, non-negative, non-positive, non-negative, non-positive, and really switch like this. Okay. So that's an alternating series. Um, and then, yeah, I can just tell you what the alternating uh, series theorem is. I guess it's called a test. Some people call it a test. OK. Pen just died. So anyway, the alternating series test, which is basically, so we learned right, that if you have a convergent sequence, it forces the summons to go to zero, right, which again is something that wasn't true with improper integrals, but is true with uh, series. So, but we also learned the converse is not true, because the harmonic series, even though the terms of the harmonic series, you know, tend to zero, it does not converge, right? Well, the alternating series test tells us that if you have an alternating series, yeah, exactly, it's just, it's like which one is the negative sign, right? It's the difference between like a naught minus a one plus, or sorry, uh, yeah, no plus a two dot 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 versus starting at negative one, right? And like if one of those converges, certainly the other one converges, but one is the negative of an, of the other. So I'm just saying like you don't have to worry about strictly speaking, which term is positive and which one is negative, all you really need is that they're they're alternating. Just same thing, they don't actually have to start at zero, right? They could start at like seven or something like that. All you're demanding is that non-negative, non-positive, non-negative, non-positive, like that. Okay? Okay, so 
it goes like this. So we get sort of a partial converse to that theorem I was mentioning before. Is what I want here, uh, positive and non-increasing. Then the alternating series, maybe let me write this like this, converges if and only if this is true. Okay, and there's going to be a second part to this. I'm going to add just sort of like a nice little uh, bonus thing that we practically get for free from this. But okay, so, you know, this is uh, a little bit surprising, right? Like, again, we know that the harmonic series sort of disobeys this, but it seems though, okay, if I throw a minus one, and I kind of sort of like alternate the terms of the harmonic series in terms of being positive and negative, suddenly I will converge, right? And the reason for that is alternating series, there's a little, there's some cancellation going on, right? You take a naught, then you subtract a one. Then you add a two and you subtract a three. And so instead of getting the sort of thing that happens in the harmonic series where you just keep adding, right? You're getting some sort of like intermediate cancellation, which means that you're a little bit more likely to converge, especially in this case, right? Because we're saying that you're non-increasing and your limit sort of tends to zero. So every single time the cancellations are sort of giving you this nice balancing and meaning that you're more likely to actually stabilize in the long term. Okay. And we do win a little bit of something for free as well. So moreover, if the series converges, then, or let's say with some S, with, I need to be able to refer to it. Then the partial sums Sn satisfy this identity. Is it less than or equal to? No, because I say the terms are positive, so it is strictly less than. We can double check that. Maybe it's less than or equal to. We'll double check it when we do the proof. All right. And again, I only include this because it's a, it's sort of a freebie. Like we're basically going to prove it just by virtue of what we do when we prove, um, prove the result. But if you look at this, what this thing is, is this is the error bound in how well your partial sum approximates the series, right? The absolute value of S minus SN, that's your error bound. And what we're saying is that, well, it's gonna be less than the AN plus one term. And you know that those terms are going to zero, right? But you, you can basically now and effectively use this in order to figure out not only what the limit of an alternating series is, Right, because you can sort of like see, you can make an educated guess for what S is and then say, oh, hey, is, are the errors going to zero when I do that? Or two, worst case scenario, is that you can figure out an answer that you want for the, uh, the, the series S to arbitrary precision, right? Like if I say, you know, compute the value of the series accurate to eight decimal places, then you know you just need to go far enough down into the series that AN plus one is like less than, you know, 10 to the power of negative eight. And so you just need to find that point, add up the numbers before it, and you're guaranteed that, you know, that's how accurate your approximation is, right? It might even be better than that, might be better than AN plus one, but you're guaranteed it's at least that accurate. Like I said, I'm not worried about that. There are a bunch of people, you know, who at some point were really worried about approximating series. We're not super worried about that. We're going to worry about convergence as always. Um, and then, you know, we also have computers now, which make computing series to arbitrary precision, very, 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 very straightforward, right? All right, so let's prove this. Now, one direction is fairly easy. I'm going to hand wave it just a little bit and like, you know, make you sort of figure it out. Uh, am I? No, I think I could probably even just do it rigorously. But which way do I want? Let's do the forward direction. I think this is the easier one. So let's assume that the series converges.
Okay, now we've already proven that if the series converges, the sequence must go to zero, right? So this thing has to go to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay. Now, strictly speaking, that alone isn't enough to say, you know, oh, immediately a k must go to zero. But of course it must, right? Like, how could this thing, the negative one to the power of k, is really just oscillating the term? So if this whole thing goes to zero, clearly the a k's must go to zero. Now you can spend some time convincing yourself of that. For me, sort of the easiest thing to do is to say, well, let's plug that into an absolute value. Right? So the absolute value function is continuous at zero. We know that, right? And remember, if you plug a convergence sequence into a continuous function, boom, convergence is preserved. And okay, so this must be true. And of course, this is just. That, right? The negative one to the power of K vanishes right, because you're taking an absolute value. You assume that the AKs were positive to begin with, so their absolute value is just themselves. And voila, you know, the absolute value of zero is clearly zero, and so you're done. Okay, that's the easy direction. So now for the hard direction, right? Because this is the, this is the slightly more surprising direction. We know that the converse is generally not true, but we're saying in the special case of alternating series, it is. So here's the trick here. Let me sort of like try and broadcast this to you ahead of time. So let me just write out, here's the idea. So let's, we're gonna just look at the odd partial sums. Okay, and the reason that we're gonna look at the odd, odd partial sums is I wanna be able to group things together. So let me write one out. Like, let's say I'm going to write out like S5 or something. Uh, A4 minus A5. Okay. So basically, what I'm going to do is I, I want to just show that the partial sums, the odd partial sums actually converge. And so I'm going to show that they're increasing and they're bounded from above. And so the way that I'm going to do that is, first of all, Let's see, what am I going to do? I'm going to do this. Right? And say, oh, look, well, each of these things is greater than or equal to zero. Does that make sense? Right? Because we've assumed that the sequence is non uh, increasing. Right? So, in particular, A1 is less than A0. And so, when I subtract, a1 from A0, I get something which is still positive. So these numbers are getting smaller and smaller as I go, but I'm subtracting every other one. So it doesn't matter. Regardless, I'm always left over with something which is non-negative. The next term in the sequence is S7, right? And again, if I think about grouping it as A6 minus A7, I still get something which is non-negative, which means every single time I move sequentially down this sequence, I'm actually adding on something uh, which is actually strictly positive, I guess I should say. Is it yeah, no, I just said non-increasing. I didn't say strictly decreasing. So I'm adding on something non-negative. So S5 is, is non-decreasing, right? So this will show that the odd partial sums are non-decreasing. And I'll, I'll write this up more rigorously. I just want to give you the idea. OK, now the other thing that we're going to do is we have to show that it's bounded from above, right? So this thing is non-decreasing. If we show it's bounded from above, monotone convergence theorem will give us the answer. So we're going to write out, is it similar to the convergence of sine t over t? Do you mean as a sequence or like as a series or as like an improper integral? Like the exercise problem that I made you do, is that what you're asking? I'm just going to write this out while I'm waiting for an answer because it just takes a second to do. So in the integral, we were, you know, we were bounding, we made this bounding argument on the sign, related it to something that looked like an integral, and then did it like that. Um, 
So uh, do you see something that is making you say, oh, it's very similar to the integral? Because we will do something like that, actually. It's, it is called the integral test. We will do something close to that. I might just not be seeing exactly what it is that you're saying. But if you can clarify that, I'm kind of happy to answer it. And again, while I'm waiting, just let me write this out. Right. So yeah, I'm not quite seeing the uh, relationship to that exercise problem, that assignment problem. Um, the integral value is decreasing from k pi to k plus one pi. I mean, yeah, that's true. And because we even like we put a bound on it, right? Uh, I mean, like if, in some sense, Right, so we were taking an improper integral and we broke it into these sort of like integer chunks, right? Um, and in that sense, maybe it's similar, but you you probably make that argument that that then this is gonna be similar to any sequence, right? Like, or any infinite series because infinite series are inherently discrete and we're kind of moving along in integer chunks. Um, I guess maybe it's similar in the sense that what we're saying is take it, break it down into chunks, analyze sort of what happens on each chunks and argue something about those chunks in that sense, absolutely. Um, but I don't think it's too strongly related as sort of a direct thing, maybe as sort of like if you step back and look at a big picture view. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't see a strong sort of like uh, relationship there. The integral, uh, kinda. So in fact, I would say you guys did an assignment where you remember you bounded log on each side by our harmonic, by basically the harmonic series, right? Like it was bounded below by uh, which one? Like one half plus one third plus dot, 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 all the way to one, one over N. And then it was bounded above by uh, one plus a half plus dot, 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 one over N minus one. That was really close to the integral convergence test. And we'll do that today if we get to it. But yeah, I'll show it to you explicitly. But yeah, you bring that up, that's, yeah, totally, we're gonna use that. Uh, that was very similar. Cool. Okay, so looking again, sort of at this thing, now I've, I've rewritten it on a slightly weird way, right? And I've had to re-bracket it just because I've done like lots of double minuses. But once again, look at the way that I've written this, these things inside of the brackets are all greater than or equal to zero, right? So now I've got a naught, which is some positive number, and I keep subtracting you know, things from it. Uh, and you can imagine if I do this with S7, same sort of thing is gonna work. Um, so I just keep subtracting positive or let's say non-negative terms from it. What does that mean? Well, this thing is less than or equal to a naught, right? And yeah, the next term, I'm gonna subtract some more uh, positive stuff. It's also gonna stay less than a naught. So there you go, we're non-decreasing and bounded from above, right? So that's the, that's the gist of it. And now it's just a matter of writing that out. And the reality is, is that there isn't much to write, all right? So uh, again, let's look at the odd partial sums. So we claim S2K plus one is non-decreasing. Indeed, S2K minus one plus, what do we want here? Uh, so the even terms are positive A2K plus one. This thing here, right, that's greater than or equal to zero. So S2K plus one. Right, so it's non-decreasing. Oops. Oh, why did all of my computers just turn off? Okay. So that's sort of that line I, I wrote above. 
Now for the second part, I was playing around with some sort of nice way of writing it. And I just don't really see one. So we're just gonna have to kind of write it out from scratch. So the sequence is also bounded from above. So S2K plus one is A naught minus, okay, let's double check our indices here. So the sum from k equals one to n of a two k plus one. No, I should do maybe minus one minus a two k minus a. Oh no, I should use a different. I should use a different index because I'm already using i minus a two. K plus one. All right, let me double check my indices here. So if I plug in I equals one, I'm gonna get one minus two. Okay, that looks good. And if I plug in the nth index, A to the two N minus one, uh, A to the two N, uh, oh, sorry, this should be K then, right? There we go. And again, every single one of these terms, greater than or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero. So this whole thing, oops is less than or equal to a naught. Right, so by MCT, great. The odd partial sums converge. And I think it's this assignment. Is it this assignment where you showed if the odd partial sums converge and the sequence goes to zero, then the whole thing converges? Is that this assignment? Somebody remind me? Or did I give it to you? Yeah, it's this assignment. So we're done by the assignment, right? So by, what's the assignment number? 13. So by A13, since the limit as K goes to infinity, negative one to the K A K equals zero, S K converges. Right, so I'm directly leveraging the assignment just for this last step to say, hey, listen, partial sums go to zero or the odd partial sums go to zero. The uh, sequence elements themselves go to zero. So therefore by our assignment problem, the whole, you know, all of the partial sums, the, the whole sequence of partial sums converges. And that means in particular that the infinite series converges, right? Great. Now, there is one last step, which is, this last bonus thing here, right at the top of the screen, says, moreover, if the series converges with some S, then the partial sum satisfied this relationship. This is surprisingly easy to prove. And basically what it says is the following. Maybe let me just draw a quick picture here. So it basically says this is what's going on. So maybe here's, you know, your y-axis. And let's, let me give us, a, here's our sum S. Oh, you know what? Let me draw, let me draw the axes. Okay, and this is our sum S here. And so what we're basically saying is that whatever, what do I want? So it's gotta be less than a naught, right? So let me, but we're doing the odd partials, right? Okay, so a naught starts here. And then we sort of jump around and all we keep doing is we just kind of like keep oscillating around my sum like this. In fact, you know what? Let me give these, a, let me give the odd partial sums a slightly different color. Oh, actually, you know what? Yeah. If I'm going to draw them as even and odd, I should start at zero, right? Like, let's start at zero here. Let's, okay, let's draw these in blue. And then let's draw the other ones in green. How's that sound? Okay, so the sum, if you look at it sort of directly, the, this, so what I've drawn here is the partial sums, the sequence of SNs, okay? And they keep sort of oscillating, they're jumping around the value of S. Now the green partial sums in particular are the odd, the, the odd partial sums.
And then the blue ones are the even partial sums. All right? And so, like I said, we've shown um, by virtue of what we did that the odd things, the green things, are non decreasing and they're always bounded above by a naught, right? This blue thing, the very first blue thing here. So that's how we did it. Now you can imagine if we look at the odd partial sums, the exact same sort of argument is actually going to show that it's decreasing amount of below by S. Um, you know, and you can bound it below by a not minus a one or whatever the case might be. Okay, so what we end up getting, it's fairly easy to convince yourself. That S two K minus one less than or equal to S which is less than or equal to 2k, right? So the odd partial sums are always less than s and the even partial sums are always bigger. Okay, and again, like we've proven this pretty much directly by using the monotone convergence theorem. We've said the odd partial sums are non-decreasing and bounded from above. So they converge and in part of the monotone convergence theorem, what you do is you prove that they converge to their suprema, right? So certainly s is, is bigger. Now, same sort of thing. If you were to re-examine the odd partial or the even partial sums, you would get a same sort of argument and now the even partial sums converge to their infimum. So you get a guarantee that S is, S is just like the number, right? I'm just trying to show you where it is. It's like, think of it as a vertical asymptote, right? So I'm just, it's not that it's a straight line. I'm just showing you sort of like where it is so that when you see me jumping around it, you know what I'm jumping around. Yeah, okay. So we know that this is true. And so thus, right? If I look at S, minus s to the 2k, uh, which one do I want to do first? Okay, this one. Um, okay, so s minus s to the 2k plus 1 is equal to what? So s is strictly bigger than it. So we can just drop the absolute values, right? And then s is itself less than two the even terms. So I can just replace this with 2k plus 2 minus s to the 2k plus 1. And when I subtract those, I get precisely 2k plus 2. Oh, sorry, I should put a less than sign here. There we go. Right? And again, that's what I want to show. And then, so I'm doing like two cases here, right? Here's the case where you're looking at the odd partial sum. And then if we look at the even partial sum, s minus s to the 2k. So that's going to be s to the 2k minus s. That's going to be less than or equal to s to the 2k minus s to the 2k plus 1, right? Again, I'm using this right here, right? s is bigger than s to the 2k minus 1. So if I subtract s, it's actually going to give me something smaller. This is now equal to negative negative 1 to the 2k plus 1 a to the 2k plus 1, but that's really just two minus signs. And I get that, right? So I've sort of broken it into two cases and shown that s minus s to the k is always less than or equal to a to the k plus 1, or a k plus 1. Um, and so that's what I wanted, right? That's what I mean by it was sort of a free thing. Like, we didn't have to do too much work for it. It was just a matter of sort of using this thing that we already knew. And there we go. We have it. All right, here, let me zoom out. We can try and get the whole proof for perspective. It's actually fairly long, I guess. Though a good chunk of this is like me just writing out the idea, right? Like which part of this is the idea, right? That's, that's just me writing the idea. So could have been shorter. Okay, so does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Everyone's good? Nice, cool. So again, partial converse. What this immediately means is something cool happens. So let's say maybe as a note here. So note then to infinity, negative one. I'm going to, you might say like, why are you putting the k plus one here? We'll see that later. And actually, let me write out a few terms of this, so just so we can kind of see what's going on. So this is going to be what? 1 minus 1 half. 
plus one third minus one fourth plus one fifth dot 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 this thing actually converges right this is called the alternating harmonic series and it it even the harmonic series diverges this converges so using 2k is just to make sure that it, you're exactly yeah yeah when i say 2k just make sure it's even and 2k plus one just make sure it's odd right. yeah so exactly true Okay, so alternating harmonic series converges and it converges to something which maybe isn't surprising because I think that as we kind of like talk more and more about these things. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm actually just hopefully remembering this correctly, but I could be making a mistake. This thing actually converges to log two or log two. Sorry, I've been teaching too much like math 133. So it, it converges to log two, if I recall correctly, and we'll check this later. This isn't something that you should know now. Right, you shouldn't be able to see that this thing converges to log two, but it. But if I've recalled this correctly, it does. Right, and again, maybe that's surprising. Maybe it's not. We keep seeing over and over and over again that the harmonic series seems to be related to the logarithm, and again, that's because the derivative of log, right, is one over x. So, the fact that these things are related isn't too crazy. But here is yet more sort of evidence that these two things are connected. All right. So that's a nice thing. We're going to use this a couple of times. Uh, do I have an example created for this? Not really. I mean, this is a really easy test to apply, right? It's very straightforward. You literally, you, you're like, oh, hey, this thing's alternating. Does the limit, like, does the sum end go to zero? Boom, done. It converges right? And that's all you have to do. So there isn't too much to do in terms of this test. We're going to use it. Okay. We're going to use it a couple times and it ends up being useful, but I don't want to worry too much about examples here because it's so easy to apply, right? Just check if the thing goes to zero. And if the summing goes to zero, you win, right? You get convergence. Uh, okay. So definition, and I have to make a call here whether I wanted to find conditionally convergent at the same time, maybe not. So a series, okay, any series, we're not putting any restrictions on the AK here for, for the moment. So a series AK is said to be absolutely convergent. And you can probably guess the definition based off of what you know about improper integrals. If its absolute values converge, right? If there are infinite series of its absolute value term converges. Okay. Um, so now I need to decide whether I want to define conditionally conversion, and I don't think I want to yet. Maybe let me just start by proving the obvious theorem, obvious, quote unquote. It's not, it's not obvious, but again, you know it should be based off of improper integrals, right? And again, you should be saying to yourself, wait, what is the obvious theorem? Right? Every absolutely convergent series is convergent. And again, the main reason that we might want to do this is if you remember basic and limit comparison tests, they require that your terms be positive, right? Or at the very least, non negative, sort of depending on the theorem. So the basic comparison test and the limit comparison test, we need non negative terms. If we're given a sequence that doesn't have non negative terms, well, we're kind of screwed then, right? unless we can show that it's absolutely convergent, right? So you, you're given a series, it doesn't have non-negative terms, you're like, damn, what do I do? Okay, take the absolute value of everything and prove that the absolute values converge using basic comparison or limit comparison or something along those lines. Okay, so that means that the series is absolutely convergent. And now using this theorem, you can get that it's just convergent, right? So this is the theorem that allows us to be able to use the limit comparison test and the basic comparison test on series that don't necessarily have uh, positive terms. Okay, 
And the proof of this is exactly, exactly the same as the improper integral proof. And we just have to, again, adapt, you know, everywhere we see an integral, we put a sum, those sorts of things, right? So let's say, uh, let B N be the sum from K equals zero to infinity of A K plus the absolute value of A K. Oh, sorry, N. Right, it's the partial sums of this of this series. Okay. Now this sequence is again. It is. What do I want? It's non-decreasing because a k plus the absolute value of b k is always greater than or equal to zero. which is non-decreasing since a k plus its absolute value is always greater than or equal to zero, right? And so in fact, it is equal to zero if a k is negative and if a k is positive, it's two times itself, okay? All right, now what do I wanna say here? So, um, okay, yeah. So moreover, okay, so whatever Bn is, if I replace just the AK term with also the absolute value of AK, that thing is definitely bigger, right? Like the right-hand side now is, generally going to be much bigger. Uh, because not only you, you sort of like removed the zero portion, right? When AK is negative, we said it's equal to zero. Well, when AK is negative now, it's actually just two times the absolute value of AK. And this thing on the right-hand side, this converges, right? I guess actually I could have just done this without the sums, right? Yeah, but I didn't define the inner thing, whatever. Here, let's do it like this then. And this thing on the right here, this exists, right? I could have just used basic comparison here though, if I wanted to. Okay, so this exists by assumption. Therefore, by monotone convergence theorem, I'm bounded above, I'm not decreasing, I converge. So by MCT, converges. And you're like, okay, great, who cares, right? Like, what was the value in that? Well, knowing that the uh, series converges absolutely, and knowing that the series converges is exactly what we need to re like to extract the series AK, right? So now write like this. Oh, sorry, not, let, maybe let me not use infinity yet. You know, you know the limit laws work here, right? Because we talked about that the other day, but let me just not put them in quite yet. I did it again. There we go. And we know that both of the two things on the right hand side exist. So, by the limit laws, in the limit as we go to infinity, the left hand side does as well, right? So, by the limit laws,
converges. All right? And there we go. There's that, there's that proof. And that was exactly what we did for improper integrals as well. Right? We defined this weird thing. I think I called it G. And G was like F plus the absolute value of F, right? We showed that that converged as an improper integral. And then we said, look, F plus the absolute value of F minus the absolute value of F gives us what, I, what we want, right? So any questions about that? Good. All right, I'm going to assume good. Unless somebody yells, yell at me if you're not good. So this gives us then the definition of conditionally convergent. So a series, a k is conditionally convergent. if it converges, but it does not converge absolutely. Right? And an obvious example of a conditional, so, so again, this sort of makes sense. Um, we know that absolutely convergent series converge. So if we knew, right, like we can't possibly have um, that AK can, uh, or that the absolute value of AK converges and that AK doesn't converge, we know that's not possible. So what's the only thing left? Both could diverge. I guess that's true, but that's kind of dumb. So the only sort of interesting case is where the sum itself converges, but it does not converge absolutely. We have an obvious example of this, namely the, harmo the alternating harmonic series, right? This is conditionally convergent. Right, because it converges, but if we take its absolute value, we get the actual harmonic series. And we know that the actual harmonic series does not converge, right? So it converges, but it does not converge absolutely. And of course, you can like basically rig this. Um, you know, the p test tells you, like, if I put a square root in the denominator, that would also, you know, converge conditionally. Because again, p test says the absolute value. When you, if you just get like one over square root of k, that thing's not going to converge. But the alternating series test tells us, well, negative one to the k plus one divided by the square root of k, that you know the sum in there goes to zero. So by the alternating series test, it does converge. So very easy to construct examples of um, conditionally convergent series. But sort of like the classic one is the alternating harmonic series. All right, so we just have to be a little bit careful about that. It's just something to kind of keep in mind. Let's see an example now about what I was saying about like, why is this useful? Oh, because we can use it so that to translate a series into something into which we can apply the LCT and the BCT. So let's do maybe a slightly more interesting example now. So let's say determine if, this sum, what do I want to start at? Uh, where's my example here? Do I want to start at what? Eh, whatever, let's start at one. All right, so here's a big nasty series that's obviously sort of been contrived. Um, if you think about what cosine n pi over two does, it's not quite alternating, right? Like this isn't sort of set up perfectly for the alternating series test. What uh, cosine n pi over two does is it kind of goes like zero, uh, or sorry, one, zero, negative one, zero, positive one, zero, negative one, right? So it's sort of like alternating series, but with extra steps in between. 
And you can imagine, you could actually take this and if you throw away the terms where you're actually equal to zero, you would be left over with an alternating series. But let's not worry about that right now. Let's just try and attack this thing the way it is, okay? So we can't use, we, we basically again wanna say, morally speaking, this function looks like one over n squared, right? The cosine terms not really contributing as n becomes very, very big. It, it doesn't do much. It just goes between zero and plus or minus one. And so otherwise this function looks like n over n cubed minus four, right? And again, the minus four really isn't doing anything. So the function looks like n over n cubed or one over n squared. So if we had to guess, we're gonna say, yeah, this thing probably converges. Unfortunately, we can't use limit or basic comparison test. Both of those terms or both of those tests require that all of our terms be positive, right? So let's take the absolute value. Let's show that the series converges absolutely. And if it converges absolutely, it therefore converges. Right. So solution uh, will show this converges absolutely. Okay. So if we take the absolute value of this thing, What do we get? So I am going to cheat just the titch here. So our sums technically starts at one, but I don't want to carry around an absolute value just for a single term. So I'm going to say, hey, listen, you know, this thing is actually strictly positive if n is greater than or equal to two. And if we show that the series from two to infinity converges, certainly the series from one to infinity converges, right? Like if we have to throw in an extra term there, who cares? So let's look at that. Um, okay, now again, we want to limit comparison test it. Compared to one over n squared. So we're going to take the limit as, ah, uh, see, I, I mixed my k's and n's again. You guys got to yell at me when I do that. Uh, the limit as n goes to infinity, n minus n cubed over four times one over one over n squared, All right? So now I'm using limit comparison test. And let me just include this because I know that some people were like, the last time I did this, they're just like, whoa, what the heck did you do? So now I'm gonna divide everything by n cubed. All right, so by limit comparison test, the sum from n equals two to infinity converges if and only if one over n squared converges. The right-hand side clearly converges. Okay, good, yeah. Um, now the right-hand side converges by the p-test. the p test. Uh, okay, so that means the left side converges. That means that our series converges absolutely, and therefore our original series converges. All right. All right, we're, how many tests did we use here, right? So here we're using limit comparison test, then we use the p-test, and then here we end up using absolute convergence. Right, so in order to be able to prove this, we sort of, you know, I utilized three tests here, right? I used the limit comparison, I used the p-test, and I used absolute convergence. So you can see that they can start to stack up, right? Where you might need to use um, them multiple times. And yeah, that's totally a fair game. That's why you sort of need to ingrain these things inside of you and, and do a ton of examples of these things just so you get used to being like, oh, what test should I use when, right? And really there's sort of no substitute for that other than just a whole ton of practice, right? So that's how you would do that, 
right? And again, otherwise you can't use LCT or BCT on this summon because it requires positive terms and you don't necessarily have that here. So I haven't thrown away the zero terms in doing this, right? Like I could have, and if I had thrown it away, um, if I had taken this series and I had rewritten it as an alternating series, then I probably would have been okay and I could have gotten rid of it. So let's see, um, cosine is zero, or sorry, it's one at multiples of two pi and it's negative one at odd multiples of pi. Is that, so it's positive one at even multiples and negative one at odd multiples, right? So an alternative way, if you wanted to do it, is to throw away, like I haven't thrown away the zero terms here, right? I just took the original series. But if you really wanted to, what you could do is you should be able to rewrite this as, but I start at n equals one. So I start at pi over two. So really I need to start at two. Oh yeah, I guess n equals one is just zero, right? So I'm not even really even worried about that. So this is gonna be the sum from n equals, where do we wanna start zero? So the first term is gonna be when n is equal to two. So I'm gonna start at negative one. Uh, okay, we can do that. So uh, negative one, to the n plus one times two n over eight n cubed minus four. And I think this, right, somebody double check me, but I'm pretty sure that works out to be the same series, right? So basically I've said the uh, odd multiples of n uh, just get thrown away, right? Like they're actually not useful. So what I'm just gonna do is take the even multiples of n and just iterate over the even multiples of n and uh, that will now give me this thing, which is an alternating series. It's certainly an alternating series whose su summons go to zero. Um, again, you kind of have to throw away the, like the n equals zero term, whatever, but you know, I get, yeah, but anyway, whatever, we can make that work. Huh, something doesn't quite, I guess I should start at one. I think this sum should start at one. Obviously it doesn't make a difference because when n is zero, yeah, so this, the first term should be negative two divided by what, eight minus four? Uh, yeah, okay, that works out. The absolute value step should be less than or equal to, oh yeah, you're right, yeah, thank you, less than or equal to. You're absolutely correct, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Okay, so two completely different ways of sort of attacking it. There's probably an argument that this alternating series way is actually faster. It definitely is. But I think that there's some sort of nice appeal in being able to see how you can iteratively apply multiple uh, tests in order to solve a problem. Okay, any questions? By the way, there is a test for if you're like alternating, but not in a systematic way, or not at least in the same way that we have here, where you go plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Um, there's something called like the Dirichlet test, which says you have to look at your pluses and minus ones. And if those are all bounded when you add the pluses and minus ones, then you, know, you can still basically have a version of the alternating series test. I don't want us to worry too much about that if you're interested in it. There's a version of that in my book. I don't know if Spivak has that, but there's a version of that in my book and I will walk you through the proof and the exercises. But yeah, other than that, um, I only want you to worry about alternating series. Now again, maybe I could ask that in a test or something. Okay, so if there are no questions, this is probably a good break time. Oh, this is a perfect break time, look at that. Yeah, this is a great time to break. Okay, so let's see, it's about 10.04. So let's take 10, come back at about 10.14 or so, and uh, we'll do the integral test, right? That we were kind of talking about before. So that's our goal for the next 10 minutes. Uh, oh yeah, you're right. You know what though? To be fair to the people who aren't here, because I think there actually are a fair amount of people who aren't here, let me post it. I'm gonna throw up an announcement in Quercus about the exam, uh, the Thursday vote. Now I can't be on Piazza because it's not like an official forum, 
So it's got to be in Quirkus because that sort of is official. And then the actual vote itself will be on Thursday. All right. So let me post maybe something about that in Quirkus today. Let me write a reminder of myself. So Quirkus 157 uh, syllabus vote. Okay. All right. Now it's 10.05. So we'll come back at 10.50. All right, everyone, so I'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, let's get back to it. Okay, so that takes care of alternating series stuff like this. Um, next up, we're gonna start to do some tests that now don't sort of have an analogy with improper integrals, right? So, so far, everything's been very close to improper integrals. Uh, we're gonna do some stuff that now is very kind of special and uh, explicit to series. We're going to start with the integral test, which I've sort of mentioned to you that you should prove on your own because it's really, it's not too bad. Um, I'm kind of even debating whether or not I should do it because I want to get to um, the root and ratio test, but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I've got Thursday as well. So all right, so we kind of are on a new, these are, I call these like non-comparison tests. Uh, and in some sense, they're they're very nice because you don't need to guess what the function that you should be comparing them against is, right? Like that's sort of the main challenge when you do basic and limit comparison th theorems is you need to figure out, well, what does this thing look like? And then actually check, you know, that it works, that you can either bound it using the basic comparison test or compute this limit of their quotients. So the great thing about non-comparison tests is that they're somehow intrinsic only to the function itself. So you don't need to find some sort of other function that plays nicely with it. Uh, so the first one, like I said, oops, the first one is the integral test. I feel like I'm zoomed in uh, or zoomed out. The integral test. Okay. And the statement goes as follows. Let me just make sure I get it right. Continuous, uh, non-negative, non-increasing. So. Okay, so this is not a sequence, right? This is a, this is a function. Continuous, non-negative, and non-decreasing, or non-increasing, I'm pretty sure I want. Yeah, non-increasing. Then, the series. So remember, we were talking about if you have a function, right, you can define a series from it, right, just by sort of restricting its domain to the natural numbers. So that's what we're doing here. So we're saying that that, you know, if you're given that function, then the series you find by restricting your attention just to the natural numbers converges if and only if the improper integral converges. And this is surprisingly powerful, right? It gives you a lot of tools to be able to use for functions that are otherwise maybe really obscure and really esoteric, uh, or series rather that are obscure and esoteric and don't have an obvious test that you can use. Suddenly you can now just use an integral to, in order to figure them out, okay? And so our proof is basically the same thing that we, I had mentioned before, you know, about this like bounding of the logarithm. We're gonna do the same sort of thing, but this time we're gonna do it for a function. So proof. I'm going to say, let's fix some um, natural number n. Uh, is that what I want to do? Let's say yes. So fix some n and n. And the trick to when we were doing those sorts of bounding arguments was to take the silly partition, right? The partition, which is just like one, two, three, four, five, six, dot, 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 all the way through n, right? Don't look at any points in between. Just take the partition that always has unit length, right? Always has length exactly equal to one. like so. 
Okay. Now the next trick was to take the upper and uh, or lower and upper Darboux sums. Right now, this function, like we said, so it's positive and non-increasing. So it's monotone. And because it's monotone, we know that the lower sum will always be achieved, right? So it's continuous. So we don't even need to take an infima, right? The extreme value theorem tells us that the uh, minimum is actually achieved. And the, so is the uh, supremum. And the supremum will be the left endpoint and the infimum will be the right endpoint. Right, so the Darboux sums are Uh, I guess I'll use I equals one to N F of I plus one, right? So the, the infimum is achieved at the right endpoint of every inter interval. And then of course I multiply by the length of the interval, but the length of the interval is just one, right? So it's literally just add up the, the function values at the right hand point. Now this actually isn't gonna be as useful for our purposes. I don't want this I plus one hanging around. So I'm just gonna re-index everything. Uh, sorry, this should be n. Wait, do I want n minus one? Just let me double check. Yeah, it should be n minus one. So this is going to go now from two to n of fi. All right. And then the uh, upper Darboux sum is the left endpoint. And I don't need to re index that one because it's already the way I want it to be. All right. And the lower Darboux sum and upper Darboux sum bound the integral. And so immediately I have, so since LF, I shouldn't be doing this with a cup of coffee in my hand. So I'm gonna put that down. So since this is true, then we get the following bounds, right? I two to n fi is less than equal to the integral from one to n, sum from i equals one to n, sorry, n minus one fi. Yes, very risky. I've already spilled coffee all over my keyboard on Saturday, it was just a disaster. It was not a good time. Keyboard's fine though, so that's good. And what you'll hopefully notice, this is exactly that logarithmic identity that you all derived, right? It's just now it's for sort of like an arbitrary function, but this is exactly that log identity that you found. One half plus a third plus dot 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 plus one over n is less than or equal to log, you know, and log x plus one or whatever the function was is less than or equal to um, one plus a half plus dot 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 plus one over n minus one, right? It's just now it's for an arbitrary function. There was nothing sort of special that we did there. So, Great, we have our bound here. The left-hand side isn't quite the sum from any, you know, the sum doesn't start at one, but who cares, right? It's just an extra term. We're really not worried about it. So if we look at the top of the screen here, we want to show the series converges if and only if the uh, integral converges. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, we basically have a series of inequalities between the improper integral and the series. So, you know, if we assume the series converges, we're gonna use this inequality, right, to bound the integral. And if we assume the integral converges, we're gonna use this inequality to bound the series, right? That's, that's the gist of it. Okay, so suppose the series converges. Did I start my sums at one? Yes, I did, okay. Okay, so we're gonna assume that the series converges and I'm gonna say let f of x be the integral from one to x of f, which is a non-decreasing function, right? Because f is uh, non-negative, right? So because f is non-negative, the derivative of capital of F is little f, which is itself non-negative. So F is you know, non-decreasing. So let F be a non-increasing function. We just need to show it's bounded from above. So now F 
of x is equal to integral from one to x, f is going to be less than or equal to. Now, I hate using this, but this is just the right time to do it. So I'm going to take the ceiling of x, right? I.e., I'm going to take the natural, the next natural number, which is bigger. I probably just could have said, let n be the any integer, which is bigger than x, right? But whatever, let's use the ceiling. How often do we get to use that? Like I said, I, I actually really don't like using it, but whatever. Right, and so there we go. The right-hand side doesn't depend on X at all, so I've bounded capital F from above. So by the monotone convergence theorem for functions, remember, we had the same thing. If you've got a function, which is non-decreasing and bounded from above, it also converges. The proofs are almost identical. So F, the limit as, as X goes to infinity of F of X exists, and that's it precisely the improper integral. So by the MCT for functions, one to infinity F limit as X goes to infinity F of X exists, right? And therefore converges. So we assume that the series converges, we show that the improper integral converges, voila, we're, we're in a good place. And now the opposite direction. So now we're gonna suppose, this one's even easier. So suppose that the integral from one to infinity F converges. Okay, so now we're going to use, so, oh, hey, conveniently, this inequality is still at the top of the screen. Um, so, right, we're gonna use the left half of this inequality. Uh, and, you know, to make it work out, I'm going to have to throw f of 1 in there because the series on the left technically starts at 2 and I need my series to start at 1, but, you know, morally speaking, again, who cares? So suppose this converges, uh, let Sn be the partial sums which is a non-decreasing sequence. Uh, right, because all the fi's are, again, non-negative. So uh, we get this non-decreasing sequence. So again, we just need to show it's bounded from above. So to show this is bounded from above, note that we have the sum from i equals 1 to n fi is equal to f of one plus the sum from i equals two to n f i. Which is less than that, right? So again, I just, in order to make the inequality work out, I just had to throw an f of one on, on both sides. You probably could, like, we could do this argument just by showing that the uh, sum from two to n converges and then obviously the sum from one to n converges, but whatever, you know, we, it doesn't cost us much to put this in. And there we go. We've now bounded the series from above by using the improper integral. And so by MCT, it converges. All right, and we're done. Any questions? That's good. All right, scream at me if that doesn't make sense. But like I said, we've kind of played with this already, right? So now it's just sort of like a matter of taking those bounds and taking them to the to the limit, no pun intended, or totally pun intended. But you know, take you you've bounded your function in terms of your series, and now you can take a limit as you go to infinity, right? Okay. 
So let's do an example. I really love this next example because I think it's a, it's a really cool little thing here because I think it's actually a little bit surprising. So example, So let's determine if this sum converges. Now, let me just, we got to be careful about the lower bound here. Let's determine if that converges. K log K. My K there kind of looks like an X. Let me redraw that. K like that. Okay. Now, I think when you ask a student early if they think this converges, actually, what do you guys think? So without, don't do the integral test, okay? If you can do it in your head, don't do it because that's cheating. What do you think? Like, does this converge? Does it not converge? So you're saying it, it does converge? Okay, and Sophia's like, eh, there seems to be lots of uncertainty in that answer. So here's, here's a very strong argument, and it's, it's a great argument. So the p-test tells you one over k to the p, converges if and only if p is greater than one, right? <laughs> so, so, okay, now p test says that, <laughs> let's find out, let's find out. p test says one over k to the power of p converges if and only if p is greater than one. And so a great way of thinking about this is that is it says that your, your sum has to go to zero fast enough, right? Like one over the square root of K goes to zero so slowly that it actually diverges, right? One over K squared goes to zero really quickly. So much so that as K becomes very big, the, uh, you know, when you throw in more sums there, it doesn't actually, you know, influence anything. So this seems to be some sort of statement about how quickly your summon going to zero and how that affects your convergence. In which case, the k equals one case is the boundary case, right? It's the case at which things flip, right? So if I look at this, we know this thing diverges, right? Because it's a harmonic series. And it seems like anything which goes to zero faster than one over k converges, and anything which goes to zero slower than one over k diverges. Does that make sense? Do you, do you guys see this in the p-test that this is kind of morally what the p-test is saying? Okay, so now look at the thing, the blue example, one over K log K, that goes to zero faster than one over K. Is that, does everyone agree with that as well? Right? Yeah, because like K times log K is bigger than K. So if you reciprocate those things, right? One, like one over K log K should go to zero faster than one over K. And so the, you know, if we were to make some sort of p-test argument here, we'd say, oh, then it seems like it should probably converge, right? It's going to zero faster than one over K. One over K represents that boundary case where if you go to zero faster, then you must converge. No, it doesn't. The sum does not converge. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no, W by the integral test, which we're going to see. So the function here, right? So let's compare this to F equals F of X equals one over X log X. Right? This is continuous. It is non-increasing and it's non-negative, right? On the interval one to infinity. Uh, if K is greater than... 10 log k will be positive increasing. What do you mean? I'm not quite certain what you're asking. I mean, you can't have k on both sides there. I'm not certain like what k greater than, okay, so if k is greater than 10, then what? Remember this is log here is log base e, right? So in fact, it's, it's actually like, technically we got to start at k equals three, right? But Again, we're not, for convergence, we're not worried about the k equals two term. Right, okay. So yeah, it's positive. It's not increasing whole nine yards. 
right? And again, technically we got to start at k equals three, but whatever, we're not worried about that. So we're gonna let f be this function uh, and we're gonna use the integral test on this. So we're gonna get the integral from one to infinity x log x. Here, let's actually, let's do it from three, right? Just to, you know, you can change your lower bound of integration as much as you want. Clearly it doesn't affect the proof. Let's start at three, just to make sure, you know, we satisfy the conditions of the theorem. So this is gonna be the limit as b goes to infinity, three to the b, one over x log x, right? Now, do you guys remember how to do this? Maybe I shouldn't go straight to the answer. All right, but this is a substitution. So we're gonna get the limit as b goes to infinity of log three to log b, one over u du, which definitely just is log u. So we're gonna get what? We're gonna get log, log b, log, log three. And right, log, log b does not converge. It, go, it converges real slow, right? Log, log b diverges off to infinity and it's, it's insanely slow. Like log by itself is slow, but log of log is, is insanely slow, right? Nonetheless, it does not converge. So by the integral test, this also diverges. All right? And so it turns out that we really have to be careful because the p-test only works if it looks like one over, you know, k to some power. And throwing something else in there like a log isn't good enough. And the reason for that is that log actually, right, again, if you think about log, for really big value, it, it, log grows so slowly that even though k log k is strictly bigger than k, it take like k does not growing fast enough to really significantly contribute um, to how slowly one over, like one over k log k is effectively one over k uh, for, for large values of k because log is so slow growing and it grows even slower as k gets big, right? Like if you think about the graph of log, right? It kind of like, it really sort of flattens out. And we know that because the derivative of log is one over x. So as k becomes very big, one over k log k is effectively just one over k. Is, is sort of the idea there. And it, it turns out, yeah, that's not enough. It's, it's not enough to force convergence. It is diverging, yeah. The, the sum diverges. And I would recommend, you know, go into Desmos, go into Wolfram Alpha and plot one over X and plot one over X log X. And look at these two things when they're both equal to 10,000, right? And the reality is they're basically the same number. Uh, the, there's almost no difference between them. Even though log K, strictly speaking, uh, is, is going to make, you know, one over K log K go to zero faster than uh, one over K. It's not good enough, right? Because it just, it grows so slowly that it doesn't really, it doesn't push the, the harmonic series into that convergent uh, domain. And it turns out you can do all sorts of really fishy stuff where you, if you keep throwing logs onto this, you can, you can make this thing converge faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, or, or you can make one over k times some gross function, and you can make that thing converge to zero faster and faster and faster, and still the whole series diverges. It turns out that's not too hard to prove. Right? So same sort of thing, like what you could do, you could imagine it's really easy to uh, modify this example. to do something like the following. 
Uh, where do we need to start here? I don't know. Let's just choose four. Let's just make something up. Right? This grow like goes to zero, right? The summoned here, right? I've added on this part right on here. I've added that. It now goes to zero even faster than the previous thing did, right? Because I've added something else, which is also diverging. And so when I take one over it, it's going to make it go to zero even faster. This is still not enough, right? This, even though this is growing or going to zero, the, the, the summons here are going to zero faster than our previous example, it's still not enough to make it converge. Right. And then if you throw a log of log of log K in here, like a threefold compositional logs goes to zero even faster, still not enough for convergence. And you can just keep on doing this. You can do it as much as you want. Just keep on tacking an n fold composition of logs into your denominator here. And this it's a straightforward integral test. Right. Like, look at this. Look at this. Uh, look at this series here. Right. If you let your you be this thing, it's derivative is one over k log k, right? So it's a very straightforward integral. <coughs> Excuse me. The integral, integral you get will be log of log of log, right? So if you have a, a two-fold composition of logs here, when you integrate it, you'll get a three-fold composition of logs. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times you compose the logs together. You'll always diverge, right? So you can just keep on tacking these n-fold compositions of logs into the denominator. You converge to zero faster and faster and faster every time you do that but it's never enough. It's never good enough to force the harmonic series into the convergent domain, right? Um, and that's just, unfortunately, there isn't actually, you can prove mathematically, this proves mathematically that there is no threshold. There is no function that sort of represents um, the actual cutoff between uh, jumping from convergent to divergent, um, just based off of how quickly your function goes to zero. Do you know what I mean? So, there, it's sort of like, uh, even though this region is, is small, there's no hard cutoff. It's like an open interval, right? You can get as close to the edge as you want, but you can't actually touch the edge. It's like an open interval in that sense, but now in function space, that there isn't actually a single function that you can say, if I converge to zero faster than this function, then I converge. That function doesn't exist, and this is basically how you prove it. Okay, because basically you just keep throwing log k's on, and it, it won't it won't do the trick. Okay, so that's the integral test, and again, you can see that this is actually surprisingly useful. There are times where it's gonna it's gonna jump out. And it's gonna be obvious that you use the integral test. Like for example, you know, if I throw like a, what like an, an exponential, right? Like if you see an e to the x or an e to the k, if you see a series with an e to the k in it, or an e to the negative k, you're probably like, oh yeah, maybe I should use an integral test there, right? Because I don't really know how to play with, you know, right? Like I don't know how to play with this thing as a series, but I totally know how to play with this thing as an integral. Like that's not scary as an integral at all. So you see something like this and you're like, oh yeah, okay, obviously I'm gonna use the integral test. Um, same sort of thing. Like generally, if you see sines and cosines, um, that aren't like some multiple of pi. Uh, that's a, another kind of big sign that, yeah, those things don't kind of show up organically in series. So that kind of hints at an integral test, right? But one over k log k, that's totally, I don't think that's a weird thing. Um, so, you know, how would we have dealt with this thing, right? Without the integral test, what would we have done here? All right, it would have been messy, would have been really nasty. So that's a nice, Nice little uh, example of something we can do there. Okay. Do I want to start this? Uh, it's probably better to be ahead than behind. Yeah, okay, maybe I will start it. I'm throwing a lot at you today. If we have to review this next time, I'm totally fine with that. But let me let me start this. So uh, this is, in my opinion, the most important test you're gonna have. Uh, 
Okay, if your brain is fried, whatever the case is, find the effort because this is the most important test. Okay, this is the, the most single most used test that you will have, whether you're doing series or whether we're doing what we're gonna do for the next couple of weeks, which is like um, series of functions and stuff like this. This is the most used test, okay? It is the most important one. Okay, and like I said, we'll review it next time. Again, if there's like sort of overwhelming demand um, and here's how it goes. So suppose AN is a sequence. such that the limit as k goes to infinity, well, let's do n, a n plus one over a n equals L. So in particular, I'm saying this exists, okay? So it's a sequence such that if you take the, you basically you're gonna construct a new sequence and that sequence is the ratios of the terms of adjacent terms of, of the original sequence, right? Which seems a little bit weird, but you'll see why we're gonna do this in a second. So suppose a n is the sequence, you compute the limit of its ratios and you get some, some, some number L. Okay, so one. Ah, oh, sorry, let's take the absolute values here. So if L is between zero and one, then the series generated by AK is absolutely convergent. Right, and therefore convergent. But it's but we're going to prove something strong. We're going to prove it's actually absolutely convergent. But from that, obviously, you get convergent. Now, if L is greater than one, then the series diverges. And notice that, like, that's not saying is not absolutely convergent. That's not what L greater than one tells you. It doesn't tell you that it's not absolutely convergent because not absolutely convergent is useless, right? Uh, knowing that a series is not absolutely convergent doesn't tell you anything about the original series because you could be conditionally convergent, right? No, that's not what it's saying. This is ex explicitly saying if L is bigger than one, then the original series diverges. If L is equal to one, tough. Inconclusive. Okay. And by inconclusive here, we mean that we can explicitly construct examples of both convergent and divergent series for which this limit is equal to one. So when the, if this limit is equal to one, you don't know anything. And this test does not apply. <clears throat> okay. So this is an awesome, awesome test, super cool, right? And the a big reason why it's super cool is again, you don't need to compare it to anything. You're really just using a property of the, C, uh, like of the series itself, right? You're taking, you're computing this ratio, you're taking a limit, and then just based off of that limit, you can tell whether this thing converges or not, right? That's super cool. That's like really, really powerful. Now, can anyone tell me what does this look like? Like, what else do we know of where if something is between like zero and one, it converges, and if it's bigger than one, that it converges? Like, what sort of series does that remind you of? All right, we've only learned about so many series. You got some sort of number here. If that number is between zero and one, it converges. If it's bigger than one, it diverges. That, does that remind anyone of anything? Okay, yeah, that's fair. That's, that's on me. Uh, yeah, okay, p-test, that is a that is a, uh, a series, definitely for sure. And you're right, if it's less than one, converges. If it's greater than one, diverges. 
Okay, that's actually not what I was going for, but 100% you're right. That is a probably in some sense a better analogy than what I, um, what I was comparing to. What I'm thinking actually of here though is a geometric series, right? So we know that if you take the common ratio and if it's common ratio, common ratio is between zero and one, it converges and if it's bigger than one, it diverges. So you're all right, p-test is totally a right answer based off of what I've said. You probably don't see yet why the geometric series is coming in here, but it turns out we're gonna use a basic comparison test against the geometric series. And the ratio, like the fact that this limit is equal to L is enough to construct a geometric series, which I think is kind of crazy, right? Like that's bananas that that works. But p-test actually is a totally valid answer based off of us sort of just sitting here, you know, looking at stuff. Because who's like, yeah, the geometric series is clearly going to be important, right? Nobody. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's start. We have to do sort of two cases. Let's do the case where zero uh, or L is between zero and one. So case, okay. So fix some number little L between L and one. Okay, and we can do that because we assume that capital L is strictly less than one, right? And so just, you know, completeness of the reals, there's some number between it and one. So let's call that number little l. And the reason why we're going to do this is so that we can do the following. Do I want less than or less than or equal to? I could just make it strictly less than. So let's make it strictly less than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, I think I'm okay, but we could switch to n if we want. Okay. Okay. So does everyone see that this is true? I think you have to think about this run for a second, but it's not too bad. So. Right? Again, you know that this thing converges to some limit L. But you don't know what it looks like, right? So it could do all sorts of crazy things. It could like jump up and down and around. It could do something like this, right? Maybe let me add a couple more points here. Whatever. My sequence, oh, this is such a messy sequence. Whatever. It looks like this. And the number one is hanging out up here. Right? So basically it says choose some number little l in between there and eventually every element of the sequence has to be less than little l, right? And of course it does. You could take epsilon to be capital L or sorry, little l minus capital L. And then you're guaranteed that every element of the sequence is eventually within an epsilon band of capital L and in particular, therefore must be less than little l. Does that make sense? Does everyone see that? Like if the sequence is converging to big L, like eventually it always has to be less than some number, bigger than, you know, big L. Is everyone okay with that? Because the, the proof critically relies on this. So because we can't do it for big L, Right, this the statement is not true for big L. Right, like think about what would happen if I wanted to put this here, right? Like I can't guarantee that my sequence is like my I don't know that my sequence is, for example, monotone increasing, right? So my sequence of ratios here could go above little or could go above big L and then beneath big L and then above big L and beneath big L, right? It could alternate on either side of big L. And so I can't say that it's always less than big L or always bigger than big L. I can't do that. But if I allow myself a little epsilon of space, then I can guarantee that I'm always bounded like, you know, that's an upper bound by choosing a little epsilon. Right, because the sequence has to narrow in on capital L. Eventually, it has to be within that epsilon band. And if you use the top part of that, you know, capital L plus epsilon, 
then eventually the sequence always has to live beneath that. And now I can say there's a strict inequality here. The, yeah, little, because I don't, we totally could use the epsilon band. It's just, I don't want to walk around. Like what would I probably choose? I'd probably choose like one minus L over two, right? And then I would use L plus epsilon as my upper half. We could totally do that, but you're gonna see, this is actually really messy to carry, to walk around with. So yeah, so exactly. So all I wanna do is just kind of like, let's convince ourselves that this is okay using some sort of epsilon delta definition. Um, but we don't want to walk around with this stuff because it's ugly. It's ugly, ugly, ugly. And you'll see in a second why that's true. Okay, so we're just going to put a little L here and be convinced of it um, like this. Okay, now the power of this is the following. So the fact that the absolute value of AK plus one divided by the absolute value of AK is less than L, well, that's equivalent to saying that this is true. And so what happens? Note that if we just recursively apply this relationship, this is the same thing as saying a n plus k is less than l to the k times a fixed n, right? This n here is fixed. This is not now moving. Does everyone see that last one or do I need to do a couple of them for you to see? Is this, is this line okay? Is people, or is, yell if that's not okay. I you know what, I suspect it's not okay. I'm gonna write out a couple of them anyway, just so you can see it. Okay, so a k plus two is then less than L a k plus one. So now I'm gonna apply it again and I'm gonna L squared uh, sorry, N, I should use capital N. Right? And then if I do A N plus three, that's less than L, you know, A N plus two. And if I put that in there, I'm going to get less than L cubed A N. So does everyone see it? Like I just keep applying this uh, recursively and iteratively so that I can get back to the absolute value of a n. Okay, so this is what I have now. Maybe let me just kind of actually move this up. So let me make this like green or something as a note. And then I'm going to like move this. Why can't I move it? Okay. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to move that up there. This is sort of like a side thing. Okay, great. This is now a geometric series, right? That absolute value of an term is just fixed. So the, this is a geometric series in little l. Right? And it's less than one, so it converges. So by the basic comparison theorem, or test, so by the BCT, that converges. Is everyone okay with that? Right, I bet the right-hand side here, this L to the K times the absolute value of A capital N, that is a geometric series whose common ratio is less than one, and therefore it converges. So by the basic comparison test, I now have a bunch of positive terms, and I've bounded A N plus K above by something which converges. So by the basic comparison test, this series converges. But if this series converges, Right? Who cares that I started, or equivalently, right? Like here, let me write this in a slightly different way. This is the sum from k equals capital N to infinity of AK. If this thing converges, then the whole series converges because you only excluded finitely many terms, right? You only excluded the term from like k equals one to k equals capital N minus one. And so if this thing converges, if you add in N minus one terms, that also converges.
right? And that's what we wanted to prove. The theorem statement says, if capital L is between zero and one, then AK converges absolutely. Well, yeah, that's what we just proved. Right? Just by comparing to uh, a geometric series. Okay, so we don't have time to finish it. But I want you to try it yourself. Okay? So if L is bigger than one, the exact same argument holds, but this inequality, this less than sign, becomes a greater than sign. And from that, you can conclude that the series diverges absolutely, but that's not enough, right? We actually need that the, not, not just that the absolute uh, series diverges, we need that the original series diverges. So there's almost nothing to do here, but you need to convince yourself that if the absolute series diverges, then that is actually enough in this case to tell us that no, the series can't be absolutely or conditionally convergent, the original series actually diverges, all right? So try that on your own, flip that, less than sign to a greater than sign and find a way to convince yourself that the original series diverges. For the L equals one is inconclusive case, you'll see that neither of our proofs work. If you want, I'm not gonna prove that one because it's not very interesting, I think, but basically what you need to do is come up with a convergent and a divergent series that both give you L equals one. And then um, like you're done. So if you want to, you can try that as well. Come out, try coming up with convergent and divergent series where this, this ratio is one. Okay, so we'll pick that up on Thursday. That worked out great. Actually, you guys can just sort of mull on uh, this geometric series argument. And yeah, like I said, we'll take it up again on Thursday. And uh, we'll do a couple of examples then so that you can see why this thing is so useful. All right, everyone. So that is that. Yeah, no problem. Have a good Wednesday, everyone. And I will see you on Thursday.